Should I go ahead to get started? So let's go. So it's okay. a pleasure to, yeah. to receive Lina from Harvard University. Uh, this is the, our webinar number six, I think so. And the title of this is Scalable Distribution Control and Learning in Network Systems. Uh, uh, thank you, Lina, for um, accepting this uh, to to give this talk to us, and it's a pleasure to our community and for sure you you see this opportunity to learn something more and uh, uh, see what we can do with our learning <laughs> adaptive uh, techniques. Uh, I'd like to call Bing Chu to introduce Professor Lina. Thank you. Well, I have the honor, Lina, to introduce you, essentially. <laughs> you have a very, very nice uh, bio, by the way. I'm going to be very brief. So, uh, Lina is a Goldman Kai professor in electrical engineering and applied mathematics at Harvard University. She received her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Zhejiang University in 2007 and a PhD degree in control and dynamic systems from Caltech in 2013. She was then a postdoctoral researcher at MIT from 2013 to 2014. She has held a number of visiting appointments, including uh, Simon's Institute for the Theory of Computing, MIT, and Google Brain. Her research lies in control learning and optimization network systems, including theory development, algorithm design, and applications to real-world cyber-physical societal systems. She has been associate editor for Trans AC, Systems and Control Letters, IEEE Control Systems Letters, and served on the organizing committee of few conferences. She received a number, a large number of awards, including the Donald Ackman Award and the Manfred Palmer Medal 2023, and among all other uh, awards. So, as Tiago mentioned, Lina will be talking about scalable distributed control and learning in network systems. If you have questions, you can either type it in, or in the end, uh, we will have a question and answer session. So without further delay, Lina, hand is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. So it's a great pleasure to share of some of our recent progress in developing the distributed control and learning in network systems. So some results are our most recent progress, so any feedback are greatly appreciated. Before the talk, I would like to thank all my group members and collaborators who have contributed to this study. So those are um, my former group members and all my current group members. So some of them have graduated from their group and are studying their own faculty positions in our uh, institute. I also want to highlight, so Xinchen is on the academic job market. Uh, he has a very strong background and some of work is really done by him. Let me do a very quick motivation of the talk. So in the past decades, we have seen major revolutions in sensing, communication, and computation, so which has boosted our ability of real-time monitoring and control complex systems. So as we look around, we notice that there are more and more connected smart devices around us. So they generate a huge amount of data. The data is communicated with each other and is processed by powerful computers and advanced algorithms. So people envision that these connect devices will make our system smarter and enable, connect, enable systems like smart grid, smart transportation, and in general, smart cities. But there's always yeah. one question. There's, do more connected devices really mean that our system gets smarter and our lives get better? When we look into reality, it doesn't take us long to realize that we are only at the beginning stage of transforming our systems to smarter ones. So here are a couple of examples. Speaking of energy systems, no matter whether it is going to be winter storm or it's going to be the heat wave, so the solution that the power system always go had to use is doing the rolling blackout. And like speaking last <clears throat> two years ago, like for the Texas winter storm, the millions of people's lives got affected. And then similarly, when we look into the transportation system, so while everyone is excited about the potential of autonomous driving, so we indeed see this self-driving cars changes the behavior of human drivers, which might significantly impact the safety of driving. So moreover, if even if we resolve the safety issue, it's still unknown how to reduce the traffic jams and improve our mobility. So all those news point to the same issue. 
Having the individual smart connect devices is not enough. So we need to figure out how to coordinate and make the best use of them. So which motivates the overall theme of my talk? So as a, let's take a deeper look for these changes from a feedback control perspective. And this is what's happening right now. So we have more and more sensors that spread out in the system. The sensors can monitor the local situations in real time and pass the data to as an edge device or to the data centers. So the data is shared among the devices and processed by advanced algorithms. So decision will be made and passed to the actuators for conducting physical actions. So it fits to our standard control feedback loop nicely. But the key challenges are the following. First, the sensors and actuators are in a huge number and they spread out at different locations, generating a huge amount of real-time data. On the one hand, we have faster computation and communication tools. And on the other hand, all this information technologies are still limited compared to the scale of the system. Moreover, once all the active points in the systems are connected, they keep introducing random fluctuation into the system, making the system more and more complex and harder and harder to model. And moreover, because the environment changes quickly, so it's, we actually need a system to adapt quicker if one single failure, if we don't retake the immediate action, is properly propagated to the entire system. So all those challenges cause for quick, real-time distributed solutions. And with the goal, we want to make sure the system can react fast and all the solution can be scalable, plug in, and efficient. We want the system run in efficient way, can adapt to the fast time changes and be robust and be resilient. So we can keep adding other properties that you want to do. So this is the goal, but how are we going to do it? So every time when we look at different network systems, they have a different structures and the question are different. So, but they share a common goal. So one common goal is we want to develop some in local rules, distributed rules, to making sure the system will achieve certain desired global behavior. But the difficult question is, what is the global behavior that we care about and how are we going to quantify this global behavior? And what kind of local rules that is implementable and what kind of local rules that is not really ideal? So to start this problem from the feedback control optimization of language, so we can start with the global behavior. What's really the behavior we want to achieve? So this is a very abstract way to describe in one type of the global behavior. We can use in the task function or the reward function to capture in that overall, I want to make the system run more efficient or faster. So that we can put in as a cost function or reward function. So here, like assuming we have an agent, and each agent has state, has action they can take, and I didn't put in time t here, so all those variables x and u can be your time sequence signals. So this is objective function, and we're dealing with all the physical systems, means we have all different kinds of constraints. So here I'm using the g to mean the coupled constraint, and I'm using the ci to describe the individual local constraint, like I have a limited power that I can really put. So I also want to highlight is I put in the omega here to stand for the uncertainty. So every time, no matter what we do in the model-based approach, we're doing the model-free approach, there's always uncertainty that it's very hard to really have the real-time and accurate model. So I use the omega to describe in the uncertainty. So this is roughly what we want to achieve as a collective behave. So now that we go to look at what's the algorithm and what's the control policy that is implementable or that's suited to those applications. So overall, I can just writing down the local rules they're going to respond to the local information, local communication, and how local it should be, or depending on the different application, depending on the network infrastructures. So when we look at this problem, this actually fits to our classical decentralized control very nicely. And um, like we have so many nice work that you're describing depending what kind of objective function we're going to have, depending what kind of dynamics we're going to have, how hard the problem it is going to be. Like typically is like the most general one, you can say it's on behalf. But uh, for any kind of complexity papers that's also pointing out, right, being hard doesn't mean we don't have a tractable solution and what kind of way we can go ahead to do it. So for this talk, I will talk about three perspectives. That's how we're going to use special structure or using our domain knowledge of the existing solutions to develop in scalable learning rules to solve this global operation control problem. So what do I mean by the special structure? And I think almost everyone, like every audience here has 
every like your all experience like yeah like we have a different structure and I'm able to give some solution. So here I'm only going to show three examples like three perspectives that my group has been working on. So first since we're dealing with the network, so network naturally has a network structure. So how like and different system like when I talk about transportation or energy system or the building, right? They have a different kind of network structure. But this network structure can give me some property to guarantee my distributed solution will achieve certain optimality. So that's kind of the first question we want to raise. And second one, I will like since we one on one hand we have the network that is given to us, we can't really do much change. But on the other hand, when we're trying to build the next generation of information communication infrastructure, we have the opportunity to build a more connected communication network. So if I have the ability, how can I use those additional communication to help me to find the good solutions? And the last one I will bring to even more concrete example, like the man, how we're going to use the domain specific dynamics to guide us how we're going to use the information we have to solve the uncertainty problems. So as I recap for the first part, I will talk about how we're going to use network structure to making sure the local controller can achieve almost near optimal global performance. And for the second part, I will go ahead to talk about how we can use communication and local sensing to learn those good local controllers through the local information. And lastly, I will come to using power system as an example to say how we're going to further reduce the information and communication needs by using the main specific knowledge. So let me dive into the first part. So to make the talk uh, relatively easier, to uh, be more accessible, I will focus on the linear quadratic dynamics to talk about the main ideas. So what's the problem I'm talking about here? So for this one, like we have a physical layer, uh, we have individual nodes, and those are describing the physical entities. For each node, we have a state variable here describing as a state x, t, i, and individual nodes will affect each other. So x is state, and every node you can put in a control action there. If you don't have a control action, you put in the BIJ being zero. So this is the physical network systems. So what's the problem we care about? Is that this is going to be first fit into the standard LQR work. So we have a linear stage cost. So it's a quadratic, like it's quadratic cost. So based on the state and control action, I notice here, I've just can be a very general stage cost. I haven't really talking about this network structure for the Q&R yet. So the difficulty for the control problem is we are not just interested in optimizing the single stage. We want to find the control policy that to minimize the a long term reward. Like here, I'm talking about the average one. So once I put in the control policy into that optimization problem, the, even the original problem is the LQR, but this problem turns out like becoming non convex. But from the control textbook, this is the standard. LQR control problem, we actually can go ahead to solve it. If I have all the information, A, B, and QR, if I don't worry about computation cost. So I will, like, using those recurrent equation, I can solve it. And the optimal controller turns out to be very elegant one. It's just going to be a linear controller. So what the linear controller says is, for individual node, what his control action is going to be a linear function based on every one state. So on the one hand, it's the elegant linear controller, static controller, and that's already achieved the optimal performance. But on the other hand, when we look at how to implement this controller, so if I go ahead and implement this controller, it needs to use everyone's information, it's global information. So now back to the motivation I was talking about, we are dealing with a really huge system, like think about the transportation over like Boston, like it's really a large system. So it's very hard for individual control action to have the e immediate information of the entire system. So ideally, like what's the distributed control come from is I would like to have a controller that is only based on the local information. By local information, since I already have a physical network, is I would like each individual controller who just using the neighboring information, for instance. So this problem is a classical control problem. And this is a very incomplete literature list. There are more and more work trying to study how we go, if we have the information constraint and how we're going to find the local controller. This is roughly can separate the system and optimize the cost. Or I can add in some other parameterization of how much information I have, like to gradually figure out what the sparse controller we're going to have. But today, the first half of the talk, I want to ask this question is, 
So let's say not worry about how to find the local controller is now since given information constraint, I was forced to use the local controller. So for the local controller, I can say myself, one hop neighbor, a two hop neighbor. I can gradually increase like how many neighbor information I need because probably I can go ahead to build additional communication infrastructure to pass some information around. So if I have this like an advantage of to design how local I want to be, so the question I want to ask is, so how much of formality do we sacrifice if I mean forced to use in the local controller? And if I can gradually enlarge the communication network, so how does the performance degrade with the degree of locality? If I have more information, then my performance getting better and how better I will have. So again, this question, like this is not a new question. So control our society has done very nice work to give us some special structure of the system, like the spatial environment structure, and go ahead to figure out whether the K has a certain structure allow us to do some truncation. So, but the question, like, kind of repeat the question, but I want to ask, like, how general the result will be? And, like, if I just did it with a finite dimension system, and the system structure just what I have been given before, the A, I, J, B, I, J, right, definitely not going to be invariant because every node is going to be different. It's heterogeneous. So, how much we can really do, like, how much of math that we will sacrifice? So let's like try to build some intuition. So when you go how to build the intuition is like think about the original problem. If I don't worry about information constraint, so this is the LQR problem. I solved the Riccati equation. I got the linear controller and the KIJ describing the weight, how much information I need to rely on from one agent XJ. So if I just draw this graph, this is the KIJ, like kind of view each age as the heat map of the KIJ number. So if my original problem, I solved the optimal controller K, if it has need using like all the KIJ is important, but the UI need everyone's information. And in this one, you can imagine like doesn't sound right if I go ahead to force the UI only using a small portion of the entire state XJ. So, but if I solve the original centralized problem, I got those KIJ and I look at how the KIJ looks like, if it actually naturally has some decaying information, like all some local information, means my UI only needs like heavily depending on the KIJ on something nearby. So in that sense, probably I can just ignore those KIJ that is far away from me. But how under what condition this one will this one will emerge. So the question I'm putting here is what kind of network structure will lead my optimal controller K, which is a global optimal controller K, has this sparse information, you could say close to sparse, but it's very hard to make it, like imagine the system will be definitely going to be sparse, so close to sparse. So what do I mean by that? So, like, so we had a one structure that if my original system is close to some local interaction, then the KIJ will close to local interaction. So what the local interaction do I mean? So let me repeat what the problem I was talking about before. So I have a network and I'm just putting a line to illustrate the idea. So every agent has his own state, his own action, and they have a like interact with each other through the AIJ, BIJ terms. So the objective function, so right now I have a repose um, structure on the Q and R, you can make the Q and R is also QIJ and RIJ. So the local interaction structure as I was doing here is, if my system self, AIJ, BIJ, QIJ, and RIJ, has certain spatial decaying structure, so the question does the KIJ has the spatial decaying structure. So what is spatial decaying structure I'm doing here, I'm focusing on very strong spatial decaying structure, is spatially exponential decaying. So what does this mean? So this is a heat map, like take AIJ as an example. So each agent, agent, and each block means the AIJ, like how big the AIJ is, is a heat map. So now I look at agent I, agent J. So if the agent J distance is getting further and further away, then the AIJ is getting smaller and smaller. And the decaying rate is exponential decaying rate. So that's what's definition for spatial exponential decaying. So there are lots of examples that actually, like real life examples, satisfy it. So for example, for the thermodynamics, in a very huge building. By the way, this is uh, our new building, the engineering building at Harvard. When you come to visit, I'm happy to show you the big building. So the temperature of the room well depends more on the temperature of the adjacency rooms. 
And similarly for the transportation, the congestion of road will depend more on the nearby road. Okay, so that's what the spatial decaying structure means in reality. So now let me put in the question. The question is this. If my system self, the AIJ, BIJ, QIJ, and RIJ, has a spatial decaying structure, does my global K, the optimal K, has this spatial decaying structure? And how much the spatial decaying I can really have? So when we first look at the question, I think actually our community looked at this question for many years, right? It's like probably on the one hand intuitively should be true. On the other hand, yeah, this should be that simple. So when we look into this problem, we have been always thinking about this problem since I was students, I keep thinking about this one, and we did some numerical simulation. So the unfortunately, if I just put in that like spatial decaying implied to spatial decaying K, the answer is no. So this is a very simple kind of example putting here. The A is actually just identity matrix, it decouples through the X. And there's some decoupling on the B part. So, but the B is still very sparse. It's just like one control action will affect yourself, it will also affect like one neighbor. So this is a very sparse spatial decaying, but we solve the optimal K. So we put in the MATLAB, solving what the optimal K is given to us. And this is how the K structure looks like. So the heat map of the K, okay, again, is a matrix. So from the picture you can see it's definitely not spatial decaying. And we picking one row to look at the value, how exactly the value look like. So you can look at this is a agent 50. So in the lab at the agent 50, the K5050 is the highest value, but then it's never going to decay. So you look at agent 100 still play an important role on the control of agent 50. So basically what it says is the spatial decaying does not imply spatial decaying K even for the simple case. So probably more condition, but what condition do we need? Um, so I will first tell you the answer. So like we did a one change of the numerical example, change the unstable system A becoming a stable system A and repeat the process. Now the result become quite different. So now my K is very local, like close to spatial decaying or like it's Spatial decaying kind of look like a sparse matrix. And there's a similar plot for the 50, 100, 100 agents. And then we draw again the agent 50 to look at the KIJ value. You can look at here, the peak is around the neighbors of the agent 50. And if the agent is getting further away from the agent 50, so the value decrease. Again, the another structure we're doing here from the B structure is a kind of a line structure. So what this implies is stability matters. But on the other hand, when like if if I can only have a result for a stable dynamical system, the result is not going to be useful because I so many systems they are not is self the A is unstable. So what is exactly the condition we really need? So it turns out this is the, our current result. As I said, it's a recent progress. Uh, I believe like better result can be achieved. So what we assumption we what really need like the first one like the my original system needs to be spatial decaying, and another. Uh, assumption we need is not we don't need the A itself be spatial, A itself be stable, but what we need is we need the system self is stabilizable by a spatial decaying K node. But you can ask the question like, how we, do we know that? Like, to be honest, I also don't like, can we have some other more general condition to repeat, uh, replace the assumption too, because we can actually check that. So, so far we haven't really have that yet. So the assumption two means the system itself needs to be stabilizable by a spatial decaying K. But notice here, it just says stabilizable, definitely not the optimal K. But with these two assumptions, what we can show is then the optimal global K is spatial decaying. And if you're interested in the details in our paper, we provide our explanation for all those coefficients. So I want to highlight when, what do I mean by spatial decaying? Like there's N, so this, if you notice, the system that all the analysts have been doing is on the finite dimension matrix. So there's a lot of freedom, even while we're talking about spatial decaying, because it has a parameter of the constant C and the spatial decaying factor gamma. So like how those factors are going to translate back to the KIJ spatial decaying, so they're kind of sitting in those parameters. So like me further finish and putting one graph, how it's going to scale up with the increasing network size. So with this spatial decaying structure, so what it says, if I want to guarantee performance for local controller, there's a one way to get the 
local controller, just do the truncation. I do the truncation for my optimal global controller. I put in zero, replace zero to some other values. And since other values are actually close to zero by some smoothness, so we can improve in, we can ensure the performance guarantee between my truncated local controller K and my optimal local global controller K. So, and this, how much the gap is will depend on how fast the spatial decaying. And there's some other parameters that I want to explain a little bit. So roughly what it states is, if my network size is increasing, like the N is a network size, so how much information I need for my local controller K is kind of have the polynomial log N effect. So it's, if your N is getting bigger and bigger, so as you can see, the percentage of the information I really need is actually becoming smaller and smaller. So that's what this implies, like how we're going to can make sure the local controller have information, have the optimality. So now let me, uh, since this is uh, our on community talk, I want to show some proof ideas. So it took us um, um, multiple years to figure out how we're going to really have the proof of, of the result. So originally we tried to use the algebra solutions like um, like the class, the literature have been doing. So we look at the Riccati equation and want to do some kind of expansion for the Riccati equation to see what we have. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't really make much progress. So the Difficulty because the Riccati equation itself is it has a nonlinear dependency is like just hard to say how those A, B, Q, R spatial structure translate back to the P spatial structure and then how to translate to the K structure. So it's just recently since we work on some other research like using the disturbance response control. So we change the control parameterization to another type of parameterization, which is we call it like linear parameterization, is look at the controller from the disturbance omega to the U. And here's a parameter showing this one. So the parameter well shows how much weight I should put in on the omega, the disturbances. So this structure has this advantage is if I replace my optimal control problem by op finding the optimal controller of those L, the problem becoming like convex programming. And then I can go ahead to study structure for the L. But that's it only tells the structure for the L. The L, those like open, kind of you can say like roughly like the open loop controller or like the connection from the disturbance to the controller. The L structure has spatial decaying. It didn't say our feedback state feedback controller has spatial decaying. So what's uh, interesting thing is surprisingly, so it has another connection between the two controllers. So the first parameter of the disturbance response controller L1H is actually will approximate K if I allow my disturbance response controller just using the infinite response, using all the historical information of the omega. So because this connection, we can translate the spatial decaying structure of L to the spatial decaying structure of K, and that closed the proof. So if you're interesting, um, actually I found this proof is very uh, interesting to me because I never really saw about dual D tool to look at another list type of controller. So this controller we often use in the online control, like online optimization, decision making, uh, like research in my group. And this is the first time I'm using this one to talk about the network control and turns out it's going to be a very useful tool, a proof tool for me to understand the feedback control. So now let us uh, me show you some numerical study. So again, this is the example I showed before. This is a thermal dynamics like try to control, making sure the temperature will stay, like optimize the temperature with the minimized of the cost of the power. So we take the system and we look at the KIJ and put in the max KIJ given the distance ca uh, kappa. And you can look at here, indeed it has a decaying structure. So this is a log map. So it indeed has a exponential decaying structure. Uh, we also did a similar study on the power system frequency control and surprisingly for Again, for the frequency control, the KIJ, again, it has an exponential decaying structure from the parameter that we got from the power system. So with that, I kind of conclude the first part of the talk. So as you can see, is my spatial decaying structure naturally from the physical system indeed can imply good structure for my optimal controller. And that gives me opportunity to guarantee the performance of the local controller. So now let me move to another one. So as you noted, the first part of the talk, I haven't really talked about learning and how to find the controller. So the controller I've been doing is if I have all the same parameter, I saw the big 
repetitive equation, getting the k, this is a global k, and then truncating them. In practice, this is like almost impossible to do because I don't know what is the system parameter a, b, c, like those metrics. I don't know. And then I need to learn, but then what's the way to learn? I, the system is really large. Like how to real time to compute those optimal k is difficult. So then the second part of the talk, I will move to the question. Since I now I have the opportunity to have making sure the local controller will almost approximate the global optimal control performance. So my next question is how to find the local controller just through some local observation communication, even without much knowledge of the model. And so let me talk about what exactly this problem is talking right, is trying to study. So again, let me repeat what I talked about before. So we have a physical system. And it can be very, very large scale. Here I'm just putting the X, means that all the state variable, so it's like augmentation of all the state. So it can be very, very large dimension. And I put in the linear system to talk about the idea, but the, the method I'm talking about for this, this part of the talk applies to the nonlinear system. So, and I have the controller at different locations. So there's a BI that you put in that, if, depending on where is the controller is, that's shape the BI parameter. So every controller, Right, they have their local observation. I put in the XI there, so like how much you want to observe depending on your information structure. So it can be one hop labor, two hop neighbor, or like deep, you can also add in some other information. So it's quite general. So an agent's control policy, now that's my observation. So one limitation through the talk right now, I kind of still stick to my static stationary feedback controller, KI, respond to my local observation. So every agent I, I can, since I can monitor some local situations, so they can have their own local stage cost. I put in very general the QI, RI. You can, depending on different application, you can put in different type of QI, RI, uh, that's well capturing the information structure as well. So the agent's I stage cost, like everyone can monitor some local situation. So, but the goal is similarly, I want to find the good local control policy to minimize the long-term cost. Like, in this case, doing the limit average cost. So for this problem, the difficulty, as I mentioned, is let me go ahead without really do so much assumption, like how much knowledge I have for the A and the B, since if I know the A and the B, the problem will be large scale, hard to find the local controller. So I don't, with, given the comparative system, I don't know the model. So I only information for every agent has is have the local observation and have a local cost. So how I'm going to find the local controller. So as you can like, if every agent always only have his own local X and local C, this looks a very, very challenge, almost impossible task to find in, like the good optimal local controller. So that's kind of what I like, since we can do the some local communication, let's say during the learning process, right, I can on top of it, add in some local communication for them to talk to each other, to share some information that is needed. So have some, I can build a local communication on this node, right? bidirectional, connected graph, as long as it's connected, it probably has a hope to negotiate some good control performance. So that problem. And how we go ahead to do it. So as a review, like this is a, we took the model free approach because I want the master probably will be very easy to adapt to the nonlinear system without really putting any knowledge of the system. So what's the model free policy optimization approach? So typically, like, I will parameterize the policy. Here, using the linear parameterization as an example, you can do other more complex parameterization. So I parameterize the policy. Now my parameter, the, what I need to find is the optimal parameter k. So my optimal, like objective function is the limit average cost, is the long-term cost. So if I do the policy gradient or policy optimization, like I go ahead to do one step gradient descent on the control parameter k. The challenge of here is the typically the JK itself, given a dynamical system, given my K structure. So itself is very hard like to find an analytical solution for what is the optimal operative function we have, especially if I want to handle the nonlinear system. So like how are we going to evaluate the gradient? So one, there's a different way to do the uh, policy gradient estimation. So here I'm using the simple one, which is the zeroth order gradient estimate, which has a connection also with our community doing the extremely seeking control. So now I'm kind of like finding the trimming point of the feedback control policy K, not the open loop U, the feedback control policy K of the JK. So how we're going to do it is adding some perturbation. So I'm doing the random perturbation, not like the sign 
frequency perturbation. So there's a different advantages for different type of methods. Let's look at the zeros order gradient estimate. What I've been doing is, so I will pick a perturbed direction since the K is going to be high dimension. So I will pick some perturbed direction. I will also pick how large I want to perturb it. So this is my perturbed controller. I implemented my perturbed controller is K plus RZ. I implemented it, observed outcome, and never, never really observe the true limit averaging because I need a truncating my simulation. I'm truncating my run like by finite time. So I put in the J tilde. This is my accumulated cost, my estimated limit averaging cost. And according to this rule, then this is a single point, this or the great estimate. So follow this framework. What I've been doing is I can apply the control strategy, observe the cost, put in the estimation. Then follow this zero to order gradient estimate to estimate my gradient to improve, like change my control for the next stage control. So for this, like in like recently, like 2018, like the paper was talking about single agent LQR, how to do optimization, polarization approach. It's very like from the single agents, the centralized case has all the nice properties. So we can guarantee the learning process, like can guarantee the K will be always stabilizing the system if my initial K is stabilizing. I can find the optimal, global optimal, and the convergence rate is actually not slow. So those promising news kind of give us hope, like, hey, how about, uh, let me look at the multi-agent network case. Like, can I just go ahead to implement it? Or I can add the tool from the policy gradient plus some the supervisation for I'm able to find it. So then we go ahead, we write down what the zero order method for the network LQR problem. So we now individual, now every agent, what they need to care about is to update their own local KI. So what information they need, they need the partial gradient. And the partial gradient, I write down what is single point zero estimation. So what the turns out need to have is actually still need a global cost. So you need the, the average summation of everyone's cost together. So the one challenge, how am I able to really get in that information? And second thing is about the stability. If I really want to enforce the stability during the learning process, I do the like random perturbation. It's kind of making people worry. But what if your random perturbation this time is like, randomness going to give you unbounded gradient estimate? From a prediction point of view, I mean, fine, just one time the value is very large. But then from a control perspective, now I have a I implement this controller as an online way to implement it. I have a controller going to crush my system. So how can I really guarantee the stability during the learning process? Like we, I need a some bounded gradient estimate. And that will change all the analysis from the single point zeros or estimate. So but let's, how we, let's see how we handle these challenges. So I'll just give you a quick uh, flavor with the, uh, the algorithm, what we did. So the, as I mentioned, the algorithm typically going to have a two time scale. So for the slow time scale is the, each episode. So as during each episode, what we're going to do is implement the controller, figure out a way to estimate the gradient, and then update the controller, move to the next episode. So for each episode, what's it been doing? So I apply a control strategy. As you can notice, the control strategy I apply had a perturbation, like figure out through some local perturbation. So implement that controller. Each time I will observe the state, I will also observe what's the cost, that information that every agent has at each Time. So I will accumulate all the observed data. What's the goal? The goal is I need to evaluate every agent need to have estimate of the global limit averaging cost. So that's kind of roughly the, the formulation we have. But how are we going to have that? So test out, so I have what's working on digitalization. At the beginning, I was thinking about I need to do similar select digitalization for the distributed gradient estimate. So it turns out for here is different. So what we use the average consensus in a way that now I'm actually estimating the cost, accumulated cost J. So thing I want to highlight is this. So for this process communication, even for the single agent algorithm, it's two times the algorithm anyway, I need to apply the controller, wait for a while, accumulate the cost. So what this procedure is saying, okay, while we wait for my own local cost observation CI, you also pass your CI information to each other, right, to communicate accumulated your local observed data, doing them at the same time. So it's compared with the single agent algorithm. For this multi-agent algorithm, actually I'm not really changing anything. It just asks individual agent while you are waiting, also do something else, right? Communicate with your neighbors. And because consensus has a fast 
bonus rate. So the estimated value of the true global cost is not going to affect in how fast I read estimate the global cost. So as like later on, I can discuss that into more details, like how this impact our theoretical guarantee. The same one to highlight this is actually different from the globalization because now actually I can just use in the original two time scale algorithm to naturally estimate my accumulated cost of the entire system. So once I have this estimate, every agent has their own local estimate of the global cost and performing the gradient estimate according to their own local estimate of the global cost, taking the gradient up, update and repeat the process. So it's actually quite simple to apply and the difficulty is to pick in those parameters to making sure the two things I care about. One is the system will remain stable and secondly, like the process is actually really learning something. It's go ahead to learn better and better control. So what, uh, like the paper has a full analysis about how we're going to choose the parameter. So this is a, a theoretical guarantee summary. So we can indeed guarantee stability with a very high probability guarantee. And the optimality guarantee, I will come back to talk about more later. So say like we actually can achieve the optimality guarantee that's what we have by under this condition. So, and the sample complexity result, this is sample complexity. If you have questions, I can dive into more details, like what this sample complexity really means compared with the literature in the zero order optimization uh, compared with the single agent learning on the LQR learning. So I, will, I can talk about more after if you have a question on that. But let me look at the numerical example. So this is, a, again, the thermal dynamics that I've been talking about before. So you can look at, so each figure shows like one episode. So you can look at the figure. So with the episode at E150, already the controller is doing the right work. Um, it's actually converge faster than our theoretical pro uh, predict because we had those one over epsilon false <coughs> complexity. But when we implement on this controller, it actually converge much faster. If I just if I want to sacrifice the guarantee, I can I can get the controller very quickly. So now let me coming back to talk about optimality guarantee. So which actually will lead to new research directions. So we, on the one hand, I said the algorithm is simple, elegant to use. Uh, we can have a good performance guarantee. But on the other hand, the automatic guarantee I put in here is not a penalty guarantee. It's only stationary guarantee, right? What's going on? And notice the single agent case, we indeed, we can find approximately the true global cost. So what's really happening? Let me show you, like, now this is becoming important in the, like, operation landscape is playing an important role here. So let's compare with the centralized, like, single agent, and now this is a multi-agent case. So first for stability, both of the work, we can guarantee stability. And now my guarantee, so the centralized one, we can guarantee true formality. And the centralized one, we can only guarantee the stationarity. So the, now we look at, like, says why, what's happening. So for both the problems, that should, um, non-convex, like both of them are difficult. But the centralized one, at least it's connected. So like my stabilizing K, that step is connected. If I do the gradient search, I have a hope to find optimal one. And the decisions one, unfortunately, even for the visible region, it's become a disconnected component. So like how can I expect the gradient descent can really find the optimal, which is difficult, I mean, impossible almost. Um, now, why the centralized one can really guarantee the optimal K? Because the JK has some other performance, like quality, green dominance, unique stationary point. And then for the multi-agent case, it's only had one property that allow us the algorithm at least will converge, but all the other properties fail. So this posed another question from our group is, so what's really the key of the multi-agent? It's not really that you have multi-agent, it's every agent only has partial information. So when we look at the single agent partial information case, all the challenges remain. It will not have a multi-agent. If everyone only measures some partial information of the system as the one single agent, they're doing partial observation. If I want to do the policy or prediction approach, again, we can only guarantee some optimality, the stationary guarantee. So that poses one question. Just for the partial observation, I know the optimal controller is not a static controller. I should think about some other permutation. So from the textbook, if I just stay with the LQI or QG problem, I can just do the dynamic controller and this AKBK CK permutation, like common filter plus optimal feedback control K is actually going to be the optimal controller. 
So we put in the question now, if I look at the partial observed system and I use in this parameterization, from intuitively, I actually have a hope to find the optimal controller, but is this the case or not? So we then do the similar work, look at the optimization landscape for this partial observed system. So unfortunately, first of all, I mean, we have good news and bad news. The good news is now for the connected component is at the most two kinetic components, even if it's at two kinetic components, they are symmetric which means it's good, like that doesn't matter which component I'm started, I have the hope to get in the optimal controller. And non-convex, although probably non-convex, that is not surprising. But unfortunately, once I lift my control policy space to the dynamic controller, even to guarantee commercial to station point becoming hard because there's a one important property called the cost that does not hold. And so the cost is important to making sure my system is not really go to infinite, but for the Dynamical controller, you want your AK, BK, CK go to infinite as long as they stay in the right manifold, is there be fine? So that's where the non causative come from, even we don't have the stationary guarantee. Uh, it actually has so many stationary points and some uh, stationary points that actually can be non strict settle point. All those are bad news. And the one good news connected with our control language is if I happen to find a stationary point, if that stationary point is Minimal realization, that means AK, BK, CK is in the minimal realization, then that controller is actually going to be the optimal controller. It's the like, common filter plus optimal controller of K. So those are good news. So we were hoping to use in this good news to guide us to developing a learning master to handle the partial observed system. So like two direction with it. One is we go ahead to develop in the escaping saddle point method. So for the zeros order method. So we add some perturbation, provide theoretical guarantee how the zeros order method can escape saddle points, but those can only hold for the strict saddle points. But unfortunately for this LQG control problem, it actually has the non-strict saddle point. So how are we going to escape those saddle points? So we have some progress is if we go ahead to use in the message as I mentioned, like the minimal realization is becoming an important thing to guide us what is saddle point or saddle point. So we did the reconfiguration, like the transformation on those controller, and that's what helping us escaping the saddle point. So this is still like ongoing work because we haven't really um, designed a one algorithm that can provide one end-to-end theorem to say how it's going to achieve the optimality. So if you're interested, like uh, happy to discuss more. So given the interest time, I'm going to just for the last part of the talk will be much quicker. So now for the second one, I've talked about how we can use the information communication to help us to learn the local controller. But then you can see there's a lot of remaining work is how we're going to guarantee the local controller is really optimal or not, the optimization landscape become very important. So for the last talk, I will try to go more brief. Just want to highlight one important thing is when we really go ahead to talk with a real application. So the way we can further think about how to reduce information and communication, we can base on what we already did before, rather than just studying the learning at the black box. So a quick introduction of the problem, what I'm going to talk about, the voltage control problem. So the voltage in the distribution network roughly what's been doing. So we have the power is transmitted through the power generator and two individual end users. And so the voltage will become important variable to making sure the power, like when we use it, is not going to damage our electronics. So, um, but the voltage will fluctuate. So if it's a low, the voltage will drop. And if a generation, the voltage will increase. But since all the devices have the safe region, so we need to make sure the voltage will stay in the accessible safe region. So that's what the voltage control problem is. Uh, is have been like, every day the power system need to solve this problem. So the optimal voltage control problem is like say some nodes I can change my load injection like, because now we have a lot of smart devices. So when I do it, so my objective is I can control this controllable rejection. And when I train them, there will be some cost, right? Hey, I don't want to give it too much. Some utility will come to play. And every controllable node, I cannot imagine it's going to have an infinite power injection. It has a feasible set. And uh, this is the voltage constraint. I want to make sure the voltage constraint will stay in the safe region. And the system always has all different kind of fluctuations, like I put it as uncontrollable injection. So this is the optimal voltage control problem. So on the one hand, like that's what I mean by previous side, people can do a lot of work. Like I can, this is optimization problem, constraint optimization. So I can go ahead to use distributed optimization to do it. 
But if I just treat it as a pure optimization problem, you can see the difficulty is to solve the optimization problem, I need to know all the parameters and increase the disturbance information. But in reality, it's very hard to get the real time disturbance information, right? Right now, like I can't know like what is gonna happen to even my office mate in the next office. But it's very hard to get the real time disturbance information. And on the other hand, like the network model itself is distribution failure, we don't have accurate model. Or sometimes we actually even don't have the model. So now the challenge is like how can I really figure out a way to inject my power injection and we know the operation part, the pure operation part, I cannot do it. So we should do in the real time cold loop fashion. So what the real time voltage control, like all the feedback voltage control means is, so now the system always has the uncontrollable injection disturbances. This can be time varying, like changing all, all the time. Now have a controllable injection and this is the power system connecting everyone, the different feeder and have a voltage. So what is the voltage control problem trying to do is to figure out the control policy for this controllable injection, like because I can do a local measurement, I can measure my local voltage, for example. Based on my local measurement, I want to take actions. And how I'm going to capture the good performance of it, like overall, each time I have this kind of optimal voltage control problem to guide me how good I'm doing. So what the like if I recap what the problem I've been talking about is this, our system physical dynamics and has a X, U, D disturbances. I want to design a feedback controller to max, like optimize uh, this kind of steady state optimization problem. So this is a, like abstract way, like what's the feedback optimization means. So the ideally, I would like my control policy only use the information that I have, say the X, I. I don't want to use the information of like disturbances of the problem structure. So this problem is not unique for the voltage control, it's for many physical systems have this problem. And so the literature says that we're going to build our learning master based on what we already know. So in the past decades, people had a very nice study to connect optimization algorithm with feedback control through the feedback optimization, right? And uh, different applications, so like frequency control, voltage control, power flow, like thermal control. And also like the our control community has been designing very like developing theorem to making like what kind of physical dynamics that we can connect the dynamics, feedback control, view them as a presentation algorithm. So this very nice work. And I'll come back to our problem. So what we talk about is for the voltage control problem, like that is follow that rule, I have a voltage operative function, and I go ahead and develop the voltage control problem. If just, and this is my time of dual operation algorithm. But the way I should implement it is that I can't just treat this as a computational algorithm because I don't have the parameter of it. So one thing is like, if I, I don't know the information, like if I change my control action, what's really going to be the voltage because I don't have the model information. And on the other hand, like for this gradient, like time of dual gradient, estimate like this one, and you using the grid information by taking some control action, what happened to the other node? But again, I don't have this much information. So how I'm going to making sure this operation algorithm is actually able to implement it well. So if I, this is the information I don't have. So I would think about how to connect this information I need with the information I have. So one thing is actually relatively straightforward is for the voltage information itself, but I don't really need a model if I just implement the controller, I can not have the real-time measurement of the V. So the V can come from my real-time measurement. But the other one is more tricky. I need the gradient if I change my control action to a certain direction. So how the voltage profile is going to be changed. So, and that is actually aligned with what I talked about before. Like I can do the zeros order estimate, like based on my measurement. So I can perturb my control action a little bit. And based on the measurement of the V itself, to decide by what the gradient is. So here just a, like have an idea how we can use the extreme seeking control and zeros order optimization plus the method we already know that's going to work together to build an implementable method. So if I have this kind of algorithm, so what we can do like this physical system is that we just do the local voltage measurement. Um, we can have some local communication because when they try to estimate those values, they need to some information sharing among each other. And then decide the XI through the algorithm I described in the previous slide, and then the action. So by doing those, we can have lots of advantages. 
So first of all, originally I already know my method is going to converge, and now I just adding additional component of the learning. And for each learning component, I know it's actually go ahead if my original I guarantee my original system is stable. Now plus the learning dynamics and making sure together they will work well and they guarantee safety and they guarantee optimality. And I actually I don't really use the accurate model and it's distributed. So I will show you the numerical example. Like we did the 69 bus from the PG and E. Uh, we have the renewable energy put into some node and the voltage control problem. Why is it a problem? Like um, it's, it's a problem actually every daily problem that powers the need to work with. And um, wh why people worry about the problem getting worse? Because once we put in one or more renewable energy, especially the solar. So you look at in the uh, the peak. So that during the uh, middle of the day, so we have one or more renewable energy there, and the voltage actually will increase, and uh, which is bad for the device. So now with the feedback voltage control algorithm I showed there, so you can look at here, the voltage can stay in the safe region without, it will just go ahead and fix the upper limit. So with that, I would like to almost conclude my talk. So as the last talk I was talking about, it's not just domain specific, domain specific dynamics, it's actually use the domain specific dynamics plus the existing solution that we already know how it's going to work, and then plus some learning technologies, together we can make sure we have a system, have an algorithm, like a learning algorithm and a feedback learning algorithm that can adapt to the real-time fluctuations and without really learning much of the model. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. As I said, I put in three examples to say how we can use the special structure to help us to develop in the scalable solutions. But it has a three component. One is how do we know our digital solution has the hope to achieve good performance. And then we talk about how Hello? we're using a learning method to just learn Hello? from the controller. And furthermore, once we're really Wait. talking about okay. real-time implementation, how they exist okay. knowledge okay. can help. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk uh, and welcome uh, my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, for the presentation. I think someone has had questions. They started before you finish it. <laughs> So, should, I, uh, uh, should I just stop the uh, sharing so I can see the questions probably? Yeah, yeah. No, no, we don't have questions in the chat, but someone okay. um, leave the mic open, so maybe it was anxious to ask something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can start for, for the questions to Lina. Uh, we're free to ask directly. Can I ask a question? Uh, let me see. Yeah, sure. Uh, is, uh, I put my face here. Okay. So, uh, nice talk. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it was dense though, so I need to go back and check the papers. But uh, the last, the last application you presented about voltage control, distributed uh, voltage control. The, I, I missed that part when you say you estimate the gradient using. Uh, are you using extreme seeking uh, filters to uh, estimate the gradient yeah, so or? Okay. It is. So like uh, this one, like for the yeah, gradient yes, part, right, it's yeah. actually extremely seeking. Okay. Because yeah. earlier in the talk, you had another method uh, with, the, with the disturbance. They, they follow the into the similar uh, framework, kind of extremely seeking. It's just a different way to do extremely seeking. Yes. Sure. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Dina, at some point you mentioned something that you need to accum accumulate some observer data, and it gives yes. me the impression that uh, we have some um, offline components uh, in your algorithm. Is, is it true or no? I I, I didn't catch the. the uh, so I think the different. So like um, in the second part talk, I said we yes. need to accumulate some information because the second part talk we I'm looking for the feedback control policy that's going to minimize the long term cost. So when I go ahead to minimize the long term cost is I need that it's not just like single time T, I got one data good enough. So that's kind of where the accumulation comes from. So I need to evaluate how good my control policy is. The only way to do it is to kind of wait for a while to see how good the control is. And the algorithm I was presenting, this is more like an online implementation. I implement the controller waiting for the data to give to me. Uh, if I have offline data, 
All right, so when we have offline data, so you can down different way. I try, I want to try one control policy K, and even before really run it, I can use the, the historical data to evaluate how good the K is. And the different way to do it. And for the continuous control, I, in my opinion, it actually become a little bit harder. So for the typical case, and people can do the distribution drift way uh, to estimate the total different value. It has a requirement on what kind of offline data you have. Okay, great. Yeah. So Thank I you. think John raised the rent, right? Go ahead, John. Thanks, uh, and thanks for a lovely talk, uh, Lina. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, if I understood correctly, um, in the uh, decentralized control, that basically you use this sort of exponential neighborhood function, uh, and that leads to some computational uh, issues. Um, it, is it the case? Uh, well, l let me uh, guess that uh, it, that's the case for a quadratic cost function, where you have a, a cost function that's quadratic in the state and in the control. If you have a cost function, let's say that's the product of the state and the control, do you think that's a solvable problem? Uh, that's a that's a great question. So that's actually the I've been thinking recently. But so far, uh, like we for that paper is a theoretical one. We want looking for all the exact parameters how it's going to match with uh, like a uh, parameter of the ABE. And so so far we for the paper only had the LQR cost. Um, but then on the other hand, the intuition wise, the intuition wise is we have a spatial decaying. A spatial decaying, I can even for the nonlinear system, I can talk about what the spatial decaying means. And then for the cost function, similarly for like what the cost function really means, one in my mind like the spatial decaying, right? You can have coupling, but then the spatial decaying talking about from agent I to agent J. So I can also go ahead to think about what the spatial decaying definition I should have. And, and then the next question, right? Does the feedback controller K will have the structure or not? The difficulty will be this. So First of all, for the state feedback control, it's hard to know what's the structure that should be for the like general nonlinear system. But then one thing I'm I think that's something we I think our group will try is this. So uh, if you recall the proof idea, I, did, I said like we did a detour. So rather than prove the feedback control K, so we did a detour to prove the structure for the uh, disturbance reaction control which is from the disturbance individual node at disturbance omega, how is the disturbance omega to the yield? So this is the control parameterization. This is, uh, I think a lot of people, it's very like machine learning people setting working on own parameterization, they're using that controller. So that controller uh, on that, because it can change my feedback operation problem, which is non convex has become more directly operation problem on the L thing. So I'm thinking for the question, back to your question you were saying, like the first thing I will try is to just look at that control parameterization and to see whether I can, uh, because still I have a parameterization problem being defined and I can still, the optimal structure is still going to be set by the stationary condition, like I can write down those KKD conditions, come out of it, and then to see whether the structure will still hold or not. That will be the direction I will try, but I don't have an answer for that right now. I, I do think, I, but I do believe, right, to a certain degree, the spatial decaying thing extendable to some nonlinear system. Like the cross term XU is it has a way like to extend. But what kind of result would it look like? That is unknown. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh the next one is Amit. Amit wrote something in the chat. Maybe Amit can ask directly and uh I think it's better. I don't know. Can I do this? Okay. Okay, uh, great. Can you hear me? Uh, so my question was, you seem to have, uh, in the last slide, you seem to have a discrete time system. You had U of T plus one and uh, connecting to the dynamics. My question is, how does this, your approach connect with the model predictive control type of approach? If you were to estimate the disturbance in some way. Uh, great question. So first, let me. I think for this one. So here, for the, uh, yeah. So I so, okay. Put in the three talk. I think the first uh, three part of work. The first two part I was talking about discrete time, mm -hmm. and the last part. If you look at the algorithm itself, actually becoming continuous because the analysis we did is on the continuous dynamics. But the implementation again, I need to do sample it because I can't uh, like do the continuous control injection. So even for this one, for the implementation part, the controller is still we discretize 
by downsampling what the control perturbation we should do is becoming dis uh, discrete, but dynamic itself is continuous. So that's a, like first I'll clarify the discrete and the continuous. Now back to the first two talk, like indeed it's a, a discrete because like we, we haven't really done much on the continuous uh, learning for the continuous control problem yet. And uh, discrete because it's like kind of one, like the MPC, those solution, at least I know, like there's some solution will be available. Uh, we actually have some other work, uh, especially when we were doing the online control, like if the disturbance is really time varying and we want to understand how my control is performing under the time varying one. Uh, we had some work following the MPC, like receding horizon principle to do it and to analyze in the regret. And I think even recently, I think for the MPC in the past like decade, there are a lot of people actually studying, even the people, not the MPC people, studying looking to MPC and using the MPC uh, framework to study it. Like MPC plus the control conversation I'm talking about, uh, the disturbance response control, actually can have a very nice performance because that can make the partition problem rather easier to solve. And I can use counting on the receding horizon to have the feedback real-time adjustment. So in my opinion, like uh, MPC is, is a great tool. So I'm also actually working on MPC. Just today, I didn't pick those work to talk about. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Uh, the next one, Hashid. Are you here, Hashid? Let me see. Mm. Yes. Please let me know if you have some problem uh, in asking directly so I can read. Can you see the, the question, Lina, in the chat? Uh, no, I think I probably I need to. Uh, okay. So, if uh, I unmute, if, if I'm uh, not sharing the screen. No, but I can. Then I, can, I think I can see the chat. Okay, perfect. Hashid Lajud. Which question is? Uh... Uh, thank you, Lina, for this amazing presentation. Really, you deserve a round of applause. Okay, yeah, for sure. I'm very interested with the idea that you presented about the agent with you know AK and BK. In this case, you use a kind of optimality function around the mathematic experience of X variable. Just one question. In this case, we can, in this case, okay, we can speak of conversion, but mm -hmm. are we speaking of optimality? Yeah. Uh... So this is a again like very good question, great question. So as I uh, I think the slides I was mentioning, so we for the paper, the existing result we have. So we we want with called automatic guarantee, but what we can really guarantee is the stationarity guarantee, like with how many samples every time goes on. So I can the gradient norm is getting smaller, and the automatic guarantee will depending on the optimization landscape. Right, the stationary point, like the gap between the optimal point. So, so far, we are still working on it, how we can make our those optimization, uh, post optimization based methods to even achieve the optimality. Uh, even I know the system self optimization landscape is, um, comp is very complex. So that's kind of why we have been developing the method like the escaping side of the point as a, from the optimization and also from the control perspective to do it. So I think the goal is we want to achieve certain optimality, and this is one direction. And I, there's some other part of work in my group I didn't mention is for the multi-agent case actually becoming mm -hmm. even cheekier. If I further say individual agents only have their own local CI cost, so the global optimality will be almost impossible to do. So we have some theoretical guarantee to show the station point only guarantee the Nash equilibrium. So then the next question is how am I going to guarantee the Nash equilibrium? Has a good global performance, and coming back to the uh, like standard, I mean, it's a question that we have been asking always, right? How we can make sure multi agent systems are naturally equivalent, the incentive design to making the system will achieve global optimality. Yeah. So, like, short answer is still ongoing work and uh, need a lot of like effort from the community. Great. Thank so, uh, uh, Emilia was not here, it's not here anymore. I think in general, Emilia is the responsible person to ask about the lays. And so I will ask you this. Have you considered something the, the, the your approach is robust in some sense? If we can support the lays, uh, the, the, the delay must be small, this kind of thing. What can we expect from the lays, uh, from the point of view of considering the lays? You mean delay? Yeah. A delay is very difficult. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so like, uh, putting 
it's, it's a very broad question. It's a very broad question, and the answer is actually well, also going to be very complex. So let me give a short answer. Is I think for some problems it's very hard to handle, but then for some like today I talk about some work. For example, the last part of the talk I, is a method is based on the primal dual position method. So itself, if I have some delay with uh, if I know the delay bound, I should have a way to making the algorithm still work. So for those methods, actually okay, and we have some other work to even the zero order method separate to the communication delay, delay uh, it actually still work. So, uh, but those delay is uh, depending where the method origin come from. In my kind of experience, if the method originally has uh, has a very strong convergence guarantee at and from the prioritization, I have some buffer. But if the delay is not reset by this kind of buffer, it will becoming really hard to handle. Thank you, Lina. Yeah, thank uh, you. I think uh, I, I'm not sure, but I, I'm almost sure that Marco Terra, if he, he is here, he would like to ask something because I remember I went to a to a uh, evaluation of his student about the the TAG topic, and I think uh, there is a great connection with what you are doing. Let me see if he can add something. Maybe. I'm provoking him, of course. <laughs> so, no response. <laughs> so, no always problem. happy to collaborate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bing, would like to add something? Oh, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Thanks, Lina. Thank you. So, if you don't have any other questions, I think we can complete. And uh, thank you again, Nelina, for accepting accepting our invitation. It was great. I think it was a good opportunity to share your ideas with us. And of course, we we seize the, this opportunity to learn more and more. So thank, thank you so you much again. for inviting me, and it's great pleasure. And looking for a collaboration. Yeah. Hope Thank to you. See you in the conference right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will yeah. go to the FI Congress this year. So, so guys, to see, you there. Mm -hmm. see you in the next. I think our next webinar will be on April. We'll give you a pause in March and we will return on April. So I, I will give the details of our next speak in a couple of, of days. So thank you again and see Great. you the next. Thank you. Have a nice day. You Bye. too, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.